thumbs up or give me a sticker so I know that you can see the screen. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Great. All right. So my name is Mohsen, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of St. Thomas. My research areas are in hydrologic modeling, um, cold climate hydrology, and cold climate hydrologic analysis, hydrologic and topographic analysis. And my teaching areas are in water resources engineering courses, environmental engineering courses, and um, many more fundamentals of engineering courses as well. Uh, and again, welcome to those of you who just joined. So um, this presentation today is essentially about a paper of mine and one of my good mentors, Dr. Michael Chu. Um, Although, if you want to learn more about this specific hydrologic model that I'm talking about, you can always check out the website that I have put on the slide and learn more about the papers related to this model. Okay, so by show of hand, if you want to, again, um, raise your hand, how many of you have heard of the term macro-scale hydrologic modeling before? I see some hands already up. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, Today in the presentation, I'm going to talk about how to develop a macro-scale hydrologic model. Um, again, this is only one journal paper related to that. We're going to talk about that in detail. All right. Uh, let's get started with what I'm going to share with you today. So essentially, if I do my job correctly in 30 minutes, I'm going to answer three questions for you. Why I did this research, how I approached the problem statement, and what are the results? If I can answer these three questions for you, um, I have done my job in a good way today. But let's start with classification of hydrologic models. We can divide different hydrologic models from their spatial or space components and from the temporal or time components. When we are thinking about hydrologic models when it comes to temporal distribution, we have event-based models that model hydrological variables over a one event, one rainfall event. And we have continuous models that can give you hydrologic results over a period of time. Um, and then over space or spatially, we have micro, meso, and macro scale hydrologic models that I will be talking about in a second. One thing that I forgot to tell you is if you have a question, please jump in and ask the question. That would be easier than answering all the questions at the end of the uh, session. So if you have a question at any point, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, the other thing that I want to uh, share with you is, um, yeah, I will share this slide with you after this presentation as well. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the spatial scales of different hydrologic models. So when we are talking about micro-scale hydrologic models, we are talking about... Um, small details that need, need to be considered when we are simulating the flow of water. Those small details, for example, if you are modeling a farmland, you care about different directions that water infiltrates into the soil. But if you are modeling a very, very large basin, such as Missouri River Basin, you don't care about those details. You care about trends and patterns that water uh, follows. So. This is something to consider. This is the difference between different scales of hydrologic modeling. All right, so um, next, if I want to talk about a little bit about the history of micro, macro scale hydrologic models, one of the methods that you are familiar with if you are interested in water resources engineering is the rational method, which is also known as the CIA method. The rational method, which was developed in 1850, is probably the first method, the first model that was developed to calculate the peak of the hydrograph. From 1850 to approximately about um, 1960s, the development in hydrologic modeling was about developing the theory behind modeling different components of hydrologic cycle. And then after that, uh, the developments were mostly in developing hydrologic models and uh, the techniques that we use for hydrologic modeling. And eventually, after sometimes in 80s, uh, the developments were focused on geographical information systems and remote sensing and how we can incorporate those into our hydrologic mo models. 
Um, I should mention that this graph that I have created over here, this is a rough um, graph to just give you an idea. I could put a lot of uh, watershed moments and points on this graph, but I decided just to show you three significant ones. All right. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is why, are, why am I developing hydrologic model from scratch? There are so many hydrologic models out there. HEC HMS is a famous one that I'm sure you know of. SWOT is another one that, again, I'm sure that you know about SWOT and so, so many more hydrologic models. Why am I going to develop a new one? There are two reasons in this research that was um, uh, supported by National Science Foundation and also United States Geological Survey. Um, we had two, we actually identified two different research gaps. Number one, cold, clim cold climate regions. Cold climate regions have specific conditions that make it difficult for conventional hydrologic models to work with. For example, frozen ground, snow accumulation, and snow melt are specifically make it difficult to come up with good estimates of peak flows in hydrographs when we are modeling cold climate regions. And then um, the other thing, the photo that you see on the right-hand side of the screen, it shows a depression. Depression is something that I have no idea how, to, how we uh, translate that in Farsi. If you know, please let me know. I know that it's not wetland, but it's, it's, it's an um, sink. It's an area that has a very low elevation, and sometimes it could be full of water, like 1997 in the right-hand side photo, and sometimes it could be empty like 1992. So if you know the Persian translation or equivalent of a depression, let me know. So depressions are another uh, point that we need to consider when we are developing a hydrologic model specifically for um, uh, cold climate regions. And depressions are difficult in hydrologic models because usually when you are starting a model, you are going to um, remove depressions because they create a sink so the network, the rivers are not connected to each other. Um, but in cold climate regions, specifically in the region that I'm going to talk about, depressions are very important, and I will tell you what, so we need to identify them and then be able to model them. All right, let me give you a little bit of introduction about the study area that I wanted to talk about or this um, article talks about. Uh, the study area is Red River Basin, which is in um, northern United States and Canada. It's one of the only rivers in the United States that uh, flows towards north. It flows to Canada and eventually drains into Lake Winnipeg in Canada. Um, okay, take a look at the dates over here. March 23rd, it's about, um, um, if I'm not wrong, it's about Farvardin in our uh, solar calendar. And then all the way to April 5th, you can see that there is a clear ice cap right over the river in March 23rd, 2019. And as the air temperature is getting higher, the snow and ice is going to melt and contribute to the river. But the problem is soil temperature in cold climate regions ha is still below freezing point. And that means that because the soil is frozen, water cannot infiltrate into the soil, so it runs off. Um, it runs off uh, to uh, the stream and creates the flooding scenario that you can see. Just to give you a little bit of information about this flooding, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so this was the flood in 2019 over a bridge that I took a picture of. The red line on the right-hand side graph shows the flood stage. And you can see in April 8th of 2019, uh, the flow of water was 549 cubic meters per second, which is way above the red line and the flood stage. And the left-hand side photo is a stop sign. I was standing on, I was standing on um, a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, and took that photo. You can see the level of water is so high in the city. Okay, so my study area is Red River Basin. I'll talk about that later as well. Um, okay, so uh, now let's a little bit talk about depression-dominated areas. I defined depressions for you, those lowland areas, the sinks that we have in the topography. So whenever the ground is frozen, water is going to contribute to these depressions. To understand the depressions a little bit better, consider a coffee cup or a teacup. It has a specific storage in it, right? And when that storage is surpassed, when the storage is filled, the coffee cup or the teacup is going to spill out. 
This is exactly what depressions do. There are many depressions over the northern United States, and these are all connected. So when they fill, they're going to spill to another depression, to another depression, and eventually to the river. The area of United States and Canada that has a lot of these types of depressions it the, is the red polygon that you can see in the photo in your screen. All right, and just to show you how common these depressions are in the topography of United States. This is an aerial imagery of the depressions, all these teeny tiny small sinks and depressions that are all connected together. These depressions are considered to be natural flood mitigators. So because they have a storage, they're going to store water into them as well. Okay. Um, moving to the objectives. Well, whenever you're developing the model, one of the objectives would be to, to understand the hydrologic processes better and better. So in my case, the objective was to understand uh, macroscale hydrologic processes better and better uh, in cold climate regions that I talked about. The other objective that I want to talk about, how to represent the depressions that I talked about into a, a macroscale model, into a larger scale model. This is something that was novel and was not done before this uh, um, hydrologic model that I developed. And eventually, we want to be able to represent different land use and land cover types into our uh, hydrologic model. Now, whenever you're developing a hydrologic model, you need to consider several models that have different names. This classification that I have for you is from Professor Keith Bevan. Um, in the beautiful book of rainfall runoff modeling. So you have different models. Perceptual model is what you understand from the hydrologic cycle in your area. Conceptual model are those boxes that can be connected to each other, surface to groundwater, so on and so forth. Mathematical model is what type of equations you need to use to model these connections. And procedural model is your uh, code. If the program that you're going to write in different software packages or uh, Python, Fortran, so on and so forth, to be able to model all these mathematical equations. So this is the process that you need to go through to develop a hydrologic model. All right. Uh, let's talk about the horizontal structure of the macro hypros model that I developed. So horizontally, we know that land is continuous, right? But in order to make it easier for the model, for a computer model to understand that, we divide land into several grids. So specifically, the model macro hypros divides uh, lands into grids of 4 by 4 kilometers. And then each grid is consisted of different uh, plates. It's a Lego style scenario. So each grid is a Lego that you can put on top of that different colorful logos. Every color represents one area, one variation inside a grid. So just to be clear, the red represents developed areas, and developed areas are cities and the paved areas. Uh, green areas are uh, vegetated areas, such as forests, such as um, uh, crops, so on and so forth, and blue areas are water areas. Somebody raised their hand and they have a question. If you want to, yeah, absolutely. If you have a question, please feel free and jump in and ask your question. Okay, I will continue, but if you have a question, definitely feel free to interrupt me. Okay, um, let me go to the next slide. And that was the horizontal structure. Now, vertically, every, every Lego block that I have represents one band. It's starting from the atmosphere all the way to the subsurface band and groundwater. Once the model models the flow of water through all these bands horizontally and vertically, excuse me, it's going to move to the next pixel, next grid, or next cell, and does that for the entire study area. Okay, so the structure of model is grid-based. It's not sub-basin-based. SWOT is a sub-basin model. This model is a grid-based model. The reason that I selected a grid structure is that because it's going to be easier to incorporate the grid structure with satellite data and remote sensing data. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the procedural model or the code. Um, I was lucky enough to use Fortran uh, for coding this model, and for pre-processing and post-processing, I used Python. Uh, some of you might be old enough to remember Fortran, uh, Fortran 77, and then Fortran 90. 
uh, it's one of the probably when you compare it to Python, it's something, right? It's something else. It's yeah. I mean, those of you who have experienced with Fortran, you, Fortran, you know how uh, interesting it is to put it in a nice way. All right. As you can see, the procedural model consists of different bands and different modeling in different zones. Obviously, in this 30 minutes that I have, it's too short to talk about all of these bands and the theoretical basis of those, so I have selected only some of these bands to talk about. Um, about the input data and how I select the methodology or the equations, let me tell you that Input data is your normal input data that you use for hydrologic models, like weather data, topographic data, soil data, land use, and land cover data. And the models, in order to select an equation to be used in this model, I have three criteria. Number one, the method that I'm using, it should be theoretically accepted. It should be physically based, so I don't want to use data-driven models. I want to use physical models that describe the physics behind hydrologic processes. And also, the last one is easy to implement. Well, I can use Richard's equation to model the flow of water in soil, but is it easy to implement for a macro scale model? Remember, the scale of this model is continental United States, so in the entire continent. If I want to apply Richard's equation to the entire continent of United States, it's going to take years and years of modeling. I don't want that. I want something that is easy to implement. All right. So, Let's get started with two bands that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about snow band, and I'm going to talk about surface band. So snow band receives rainfall and snowfall from uh, the bands on top of it, and then the outputs from the snow bands are snow melt and also sublimation and other losses due to snow band. Okay. Um, the equation that I use to model melt, I'm not going to talk about accumulation. I'm going to talk about melt, is a very simple temperature index method. So CM in this equation is a melting factor that considers everything else except for temperature. And average temperature is considered using the T average, as you can see. And delta C is the period of the day. Um, there are limitations to this equation. So, And my job as a hydrologic modeler is to improve these limitations. So the main limitation of this model is going to be it doesn't consider the sub-daily temperature fluctuations. What do I mean by that? Let me go to the next slide and explain to you. These are real data, hourly data for temperature of one station in March 19th and March 20th. Take a look at day one. In day one, for about 10 hours, the temperature, the hourly temperature is below zero. And for about 10 hours, the hourly temperature is above zero. In day two, however, the temperature is the temperature is consistently above zero, right? So the average temperature in day one is negative 0.79, and average temperature in day two is 1.59. So if I want to use this equation that I showed you in the previous slide to model um, melt, snow melt, in the first day, because the average temperature is negative, there is not going to be any melt. However, we know that, take a look at it, we know that for about half of the day, the temperature is below freezing, but for the next half of the day, the temperature is above freezing. So although the average temperature is negative, we know that based on the hourly temperatures, there, there will be some snow melt, right? Uh, however, in the second day, there is not a problem. In the second day, the average temperature is above zero, so there is going to be some melt, and this model performs good. So just to make sure that we consider these fluctuations on days like day one, we simplified this to have two triangles. The first triangle, so the, the photo that I have, the lower photo, represents day one. So we simplified these type of days with two triangles. Triangle number one models refreezing, and tri triangle number two models um, melts. Okay, so by this very simple addition to a temperature index model, we were able to consider sub-daily fluctuations. There's a separate journal paper published in Journal of Hydrology on this that I encourage you to uh, read that because uh, this paper is mostly about the model development, not the test of this temperature index. All right. Now, okay, when the snow melt is simulated, that's going to be an input to the surface band. 
in addition to rainfall. And the output from surface band is going to be evaporation, infiltration, and surface runoff. Okay, how do we, how do we uh, model that? It's going to be simply using a very famous method that I'm sure those of you who have had hydrology, you know about this method, SCS curve number method. Curve number is widely used, although it's, it was developed in 50s or 80s, excuse me. It is widely used in a uh, field because of its simplicity, specifically in model, macro scale models. All right, so however, the problem with um, SCS curve number method, the limitation is that it has some limitations when it comes to considering it for uh, continuous model. So SCS curve number is an event-based model. It does not consider, it does not adjust curve number for frozen ground condition. And also it doesn't consider slope of the land into, into the equation. So we use a set of equations to adjust the original curve number for the antecedent moisture condition of the soil, for the slope, and for the frozen ground. And then we use that adjusted curve number into, um, into the equation in the model. Okay, and the last contribution in this model was depressions. And I know I have five minutes, so I have to actually speed up a little bit to make sure that I'm mindful of your time. I don't want to take a lot of your time. So take a look at this is an example of one four by four cell. So there is a variation in this cell, right? We lumped all that blue area, which is depression, depressions and their contributing area into one Lego brick called depression brick and this brick specifically is developed to model the variations the dynamics of water in the depression as a whole so we don't consider depressions one by one we lump them together as one big brick of water that can lose or that can um, that can lose water through uh, surface runoff or infiltration all right how do we identify depressions there is a method called d cube depression dominated areas delineation method that uh, receives a digital elevation model does delineation and calculates the storage of those depressions and we use the lumped storage in the model as the storage of depressions in each grid each grid of four by four each cell of four by four okay and then eventually the infiltration is going to go into the subsurface bands and I have shown you this is the uh, essentially uh, the procedural model for the subsurface band which I'm not going to talk about because it takes a lot of time to talk about the details of this. All right. So the study area I told you it's Red River Basin in northern um, United States and Canada. You can see the land use and also the elevation. It is known to be a very, very flat area. So the number of four by four kilometer grids that we considered were about 6,500. And we considered five years of simulation period. And you can see the basin area and the slope as well. As you can tell, the slope is very, very slow. And that's why this area is prone to flooding. All right, I'm gonna quickly talk about the results. Um, as you can see, the model results are not bad, definitely. But I want you to take a look at this area. If you can see the, my cursor, the mouse cursor, this area. There is a significant difference between model simulation of discharge and observed discharge. This area is specifically in spring where, where, when the flooding happens. Let me go to the next uh, slide so you can see that a little bit better. So this area that I have a red box around it, this is around April. Right. So in April, and the gray box is your frozen ground. In April, the ground is partially frozen right over here. But uh, you have surface runoff because snow is melting, right? Because the ground is frozen but the snow is melting and you have a rainfall on that day, rainfall does not infiltrate into the soil. Instead of that, it's going to run off the surface. So these are the model results. This is the surface runoff uh, produced by the model. And the model can generate animations of these as well. And you can find that in my YouTube channel. Okay, so you can see that you have a huge surface runoff generated in the middle of the um, basin, which is the location of Red River and many other cities as well. Okay, and then um, these are other outputs from the model. So the model can tell you if the ground is frozen. So for example, in this figure over here, 
FG means frozen ground, and NFG means non-frozen ground, and the middle one is partially frozen ground. You can essentially tell that whenever you have your uh, frozen ground right over here, the infiltration and surface runoff over here changes with the snow melt as well. Okay. The um, last thing that I want to talk about, one of the last things that I want to talk about is the impact of snowpack on snow melt. Here, the gray box represents snowpack, and you can see the amount of snow melt at, in April when snow starts to melt in northern United States. Suddenly, snowpack goes to zero, and snow melt goes higher and higher. So this shows me that the model is uh, capable of simulating the physical processes in cold climate regions in Red River Basin. Um, the model can actually give you a lot of data related to different months, different days, different years, and summarize all of that for you. This is another example that gives you how in 2006 we had a record-breaking snowpack, snow depth, and a record-breaking snow melt as well in March, uh, which caused a big, big flooding in the area. Okay, and this is when I showed you that the model is not able to catch the peak of the hydrograph over here, that is due to this March of 2006 that there was a big event in, in the Red River. Okay, and another output from the model is depression storage and how the model can tell you which areas of the land have higher depression storage and which areas have lower depression storage. All right. Um, this study was really interesting because it gave us a lot of information about what we understand and what we don't understand from this basin. Now we know that about 40% of the year in the Red River Basin, we have some sort of gro frozen ground condition, either fully frozen or partially frozen. Um, it gave us also the, uh, the uh, connections between snow melt and the spring floods. Uh, I'm going to skip over the summary because um, it's obvious that we developed the model, we tested the model, and now in our investigation we talk about other model characteristics, and I highly recommend reading the next two papers after this. Uh, one of them is in Journal of Hydrology, and the other one is ASCE Journal of uh, um, uh, Cold Climate Regions. What I want to say at the end is what I learned from this process. Obviously, this process was very long. This was a part of my PhD dissertation supported by National Science Foundation and USGS. Um, of course, I learned a lot of technical stuff, but if it, there is one thing that I want to share with you, what I learned, it gave me another perspective of engineering design cycle. How an engineer observes a problem, how they define the problem, and how they reflect and redesign the model that you have. This is a cycle, meaning that it's not going to stop. This model is going to be improved and improved and improved, as you have seen in other hydrologic models as well. Okay, with that, I am two minutes over time, but I'm glad that at least I'm not 10 minutes over time. So thank you, and I thank you for having me over here. It was a pleasure to present to you. And uh, I'm open to any questions that you have. Um, you don't have to uh, ask your question in English or Farsi. You can ask it in any uh, language that you want to. And I will be happy to answer your question if I have the knowledge of answering your question. Well, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. And I, I cannot wait to see what you have for me. Thank you, Dr. Mohsen, for your perfect and awesome presentation. We learned a lot. <laughs> And truly, you brought our journal club to a very high level, and it's our proud to have you here. Uh, so, uh, first of all, please share us uh, your pre uh, presentation and also the link of uh, the three papers that you mentioned us. Uh, I can put in the um, group, in the channel, and the YouTube uh, with this video. And uh, everybody, we are uh, looking for your questions. What I would say. Uh, thank you so Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Gilmore said. Um, I have a question about uh, which satellite 
uh, you have uh, you have used in your data um, because you uh, your special resolution is uh, four kilometers to four and uh, four kilometers. Uh, Mm, you know, I mm, work uh, with uh, remote sensing technology and uh, Landsat or even uh, Sentinel-2 and this is an interesting paper because um, I don't know anything about um, frozen soil uh, fully or uh, um, partial uh, frozen and this is, um, a, this is a big problem uh, when the flood is uh, run off and uh, the other thing is uh, so, uh, the the first thing the storage, I think, uh, um, incursion it means uh, damage by fastly. Hmm. Okay. I think because um, it's happening in um, you know, some um, some season and uh, some season we have and uh, some season we don't have. Uh, which satellite you use and uh, um, would you please describe about this? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Good questions. First of all, thank you for the translation. I'm not sure about Dariyoche because I feel like Dariyoche is larger than what I'm talking about. These refractors yeah. are very small, very teeny tiny. Um, and they usually pop up in uh, spring, although they are fastly, I agree with that. But I'm, maybe the size is not that large enough to be classified as Dariyoche. But um, uh, let's talk about the satellite images. So um, as you mentioned, correctly mentioned, the size of the grids in the model are too small for satellite images, four kilometers by four kilometers. But some of the satellite images that you get, although they can get as uh, high resolution as one kilometer by one kilometer, but many of them are larger than four kilometer by four kilometers. So how are we considering, how are we incorporating those into the model? Uh, the answer to that would be that there will be the downscaling process of those data before uh, incorporating in the hydrologic models. For example, there is another paper in Journal of Hydrology based on this model that incorporates uh, a satellite image, a downscaled satellite image temperature data sets, topo w, t -O -P -O -W -X, topo WX. Um, those are derived from both satellite images and uh, sites uh, over the United States. And the resolution of that is 800 meters by 800 meters. Again, this is a downscaled version of the satellite image. We are not using the satellite image itself, uh, which makes sense because we want to have a higher resolution when it comes to hydrological processes. We, if the resolution is too high, the results of the model are going to be too lumped or too general in, um, in the common term. Did I answer your question, Mustafa? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I got my uh, I got my answer, and uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm very happy, uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to uh, complete in this uh, session. And uh, thank you so much. Yes, Absolutely, my pleasure. Another question. Okay, I think. <laughs> I think there is no question. Thank you so much for your time, first of all, and also your presentation. Uh, okay, if there is no comments, we can just say goodbye to everybody. Uh, Amin has a question. Okay, go on, Amin. صدای منو دارید؟ yes. بله 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 سلام عرض میکنم خدمت توی های دکتر من انگلیسیم خوب ها ولی تا حالا صحبت نکردم به خاطر اون فارسی میپرسم خیلی هم آلیه بربار شما یه سوال این که این مدل به صورت ساعتی محاسبه میکرد یا روزانه اینو یه توضیح بدید و اینکه اگه روزانه بود چرا ساعتی انجامش ندادید به خاطر بالا رفتن حجم محاسبات یا علت دیگه داشت و اینکه اسنوپک رو چجوری اندازه گیری کردید داده ماهواره چی بوده عمق برف رو چجوری اندازه گیری کردید از چه ماهواره یا داده زمینی بوده یه توضیح بفرمایید ممنون میشه بله خیلی هم سوال عالی بسیار سوالای خوبی این دوتا 
در مورد تایم تایم اسکیل مدل بگم که به صورت روزانه است چرا به صورت روزانه است فکر کنم شما تو سوالتون خودتون اشاره کردید مدلی که قرار روی در واقع یک کانتیننت روی یک مثلا کل آمریکا ران بشه اگه به صورت ساعتی ران بشه بسیار بسیار طول میکشه تا اون مدل رو ران کنی به خاطر اینکه دیتیل اگر چه از مدل های خیلی آسون هیدرولوژیکی استفاده میکنه به خاطر اینکه اسکیلش خیلی بزرگ میشه خیلی طول میکشه که ران بشه برای همین مدلی که استفاده میکنه مدل در واقع مدل تایمش مدل روزانه است و داده های روزانه رو به صورت گراف و به صورت رستر هایی که دیدید بهتون میده این از سوال اولتون که بسیار هم سوال خوبی بود سوال دوم اگر یادم بیاد الان این بود که اسنوپک آره در عمق برف و اسنو ملت رو چجوری اندازه گیری کردیم مدل اینا رو در واقع به قول معروف شبیه سیمیولیت میکنه و اینکه اگر سوالتون اینه که چجوری ما اینا رو وریفای کردیم یه سری از داده های وجود داره در آمریکا که بهشون میگن داده های اسنو داس اس ان او دی ای اس اسنو دی اسنو دیتا این داده ها با توجه به با توجه به ایستگاه های زمینی که در مورد برف وجود داره و با توجه به پوشش برفی که از ماهواره در واقع دریافت میکنه یه داده هایی رو دیولوب کردن که به شما پوشش برف و عمق برف رو به صورت هر چهار کیلومتر به چهار کیلومتر که به صورت عمومی قابل دسترس و هر 800 متر به 800 متر که به صورت در واقع باید سابسکرپشن داشته باشید و اونا رو میتونید دانلود کنید ما داده همون رو با اون, با اون ویریفای کردیم که ببینیم آیا مدل درست سیمیولیت میکنه یا نه در مورد اینم سوالتونم بگم که اون پیپری که ما مدل رو ویریفای کردیم با این پیپری که پریزنت کردم تفاوت میکنه پیپر دومیه که پابلش شده اونم توی جورنال اپ که لینکش رو میگم به نسرین میدم که بذاره روی سایت یا جای دیگه متشکرم از سوالتون بسیار سوال خوبی بود خیلی ممنون خیلی ممنون خیلی ممنون از همگی خیلی ممنون از آقای دکتر ما منتظر لینک ها هستیم بازم منتظر صحبت کردن و ارائه شما هستیم آقای دکتر حتما بسیار باعث افتخار من از اینکه دوستای جدیدی هم پیدا کردم اینجا حتما خوشحالم اگر سوالی هم بود فکر کنم راه های ارتباطی با من توی اسلاید هم هست حتما سوال رو برای من بفرستید و خوشحالم که صداتون رو شنیدم و دیدم چون و اینکه شب و روز خوبی هم داشته باشید هر جا هستید شما شبتون بخیر باشه البته روز شما بخیر باشه شب بچه ها بخیر شما خدا نگهتر همیگید